I, I, I still do believe that churches have forgotten and are forgetting what church is for. It is to hear the word of the Lord. Now, I didn't say to hear a word. I said to hear the word. So, preachers will come to the pulpit and they will give you a word, which is fine. God speaks in various ways, but we want to give you the word. That's primary. And once I've given you the word, then when I tell you I have received a word, but my word that I've received wasn't quite matching up with this word, you understand what I mean? You see, a pastor can give you a word from his own imagination because he knows that you don't know the word. But if you knew the word, you'd say, oh, excuse me, pastor, just hang on a second here. Your a word is not matching up with the word. So you've got to put your a word aside. But in our world today, everyone, doesn't, they, don't know, they don't know their Bible. They don't read the word of God. So the pastor can come and say anything he wants, doesn't matter how ludicrous it may be, and they'll say, Amen, I have heard from the Lord. Let's sing it together. Speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. Take your truth planted deep in us, shape and fashion us in your likeness, that the light of Christ might be seen today in our hands of and our deeds of faith. Oh, speak, O oh Lord, and fulfill in us all your promises for your glory. Please teach us, Lord, full obedience, holy reverence, true humility. Mm. Please, Lord, test our thoughts and our attitudes in the radiance of your purity. Cause our faith to rise, cause our eyes to see your majestic love and authority. Words of power that can never fail. Let the truth prevail over unbelief. And speak, O oh Lord, and renew our minds. Help us grasp the height of your plans for us. Truth unchanged from the dawn of time that will echo down through eternity and by grace we'll stand on your promises and by faith we'll walk as you walk with us oh eek. Oh Lord, till your, till your church is built and the earth is filled with your glory. And by grace. And by grace we will stand on your promises. And by faith we will walk as you walk with us. Oh, speak. Oh, Lord, till your church is built and the earth is filled with your glory. And the church say, Amen. Amen. Beautiful words. Beautiful words. 
the focus on that is just the Word of God, not personalities or brilliant ideas or anything. Just the Word of God, what it says. You don't really need anything more. It's the Word that saves you. Word that, word that does its work inside of you and nothing else will do. No matter how nice it sounds, nothing else can help you to be saved. Remember those who are not here with us, Sister Botha, of course, most of you already know her, her father passed away during the course of the week quite unexpectedly, 70 years old, and, and he passed away, so she's been a little bit under the weather. And, um, and our beautiful sister Veronica, um, who is not here with us today. Hi, kids. You're in church today. It's good to see you. Your mom tells me you kids are very strong. Your dad says you, get, you kids are strong. And um, I have a tremendous amount of... Of, um, of respect for Sister Veronica. When she comes and she does come back, I want to give her, everyone stand up and give her a big round of applause when she does come back because um, what she did is very, very brave and the way she's overcome, very, very brave and the way she's come through it with a smile, very strong. Tri tri trials are going to come in your life and the trials are, are intended to make you curse God and shake your fist at Him and say, you're not there, you're not good, you're this, you're that. You know, he brings with, with, with trials deep and sore, I will prove you. Because if, if God does that to some people, you know, they get very upset with him. Because God has the power to do everything, right? He has the power to stop whatever. Okay, but he has the power, but you don't know his will or why he allows or what he does and way he does it. He has a will as well, and everything will be according to his will. So yes, he has the power, but don't forget that he also has a will. And Christ was going to die on the cross when he said, not my, I didn't want it to happen, but thy will be done. And that is, that is Christianity. That is the Christianity that I, um, that I teach the church and the church to, to, to learn and to grow by. Amen? Amen. Amen. Um, yes. Oh, the guest. Our guest. My brother, please introduce your, yourself. Down the guest. Stand up and give us your name. How are you doing? Hi, Chris. All right, guys, give him a hand. It is good to have you in church. We were worshiping and we were magnifying God, and we're a bit loud when we sing together. Then we were all like, da, 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 da. We're, and he was keeping up with us. He was, he was, yeah, this is good. I like this. He's worshiping with us. That's good. The Bible says, make a joyful noise. But in the midst of that noise, the Christian must remember to be, everything must be done, how? Decently and in an order. Because I am sure if you come to the house of God and you see things that are out of order, the Bible says that they'll, they'll say you're crazy. Remember what the purpose of the church, the purpose of the church is to be evangelical. It is to help people to be saved. And when you're being decent and in order in church, and orderly in church, it's not because you lack spirituality, it's because you want those who are around you don't necessarily know where you're coming from to be able to hear the truth, be able to sit in church and say, okay, these people love worshiping God, but they're not out of order. They love to worship God, and God is glorified in the midst, but they're not breaking that most important rule of, of the church. It is to be decent and in order that you don't turn people off and away from the gospel by your spirituality. Because Sister Fatmata, I'm pretty sure you can roll up and down and roll back and forth in the air, be very spiritual. But it turns people off, so why do it? You want to roll around the place? Go home and roll around. You have, more, you have more space in your lounge, it's carpeted. Roll all you want. When you come to church, be decent and... I'm not quenching your spirit, I'm just saying, when you're in church, behave. It's the house of God. No, it's, not, but it's the Holy Ghost! Yeah, I know. But the, the man speaking to the people who had the Holy Ghost said, hey, you're doing things in a crazy way. That's, that's not how it's supposed to be. I know you have the Holy Ghost, but if you behave poorly, those who come in won't see it as that. They don't know you. So, just, uh, I'm just teaching. I'm just teaching. I want the church to know how to behave. Okay. So, I've given you this about the right hand of God. When you get a chance, go home and read it. But... I was reading something this week by a theologian. And the theologian found something that was 
concerning concerning the firstborn. And when he was writing about the firstborn, for the Bible calls Jesus the firstborn, and the Bible calls David the prophet. And the prophets spoke about both Christ and David. And the prophets of old, they would oftentimes interchange the name of Jesus with the name David. For until that time that God brought David, until he brought Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah, until he brought him into the earth, the Bible said that he was hidden in the bosom of the Father. It was God's secret. God, no one, the Jewish people never knew. Why do Jewish people re re reject the Messiah? Well, because he didn't come in glory. He didn't come and deliver them. And so reading in a, in, a, in, a, in a Jewish article, they said, we do not accept Jesus as our Messiah because when he came, we were in bondage. And when we left, we were still in bondage. <laughs> the Messiah is supposed to, when he comes, is supposed to usher in a great, uh, you know, great reign. And, and our Messiah is supposed to rule over the earth. That's our promises. And yes, that's some of the promises. But you also have other promises that say that you know, that, that he would die and he would suffer and he would raise. You, you like the good ones, you reject the bad ones, and you end up with half the story. So when he came to fulfill the first part, die, and you rejected him, so you'll never see him fulfill the second part where he comes in glory. That's why you have to be balanced. You can't just take a part you like and leave the other part out. You become unbalanced and you miss truth. But this man, this man reading in the Word, reading from the Bible, he described David not as Christ. He called him David. And I, was, I was shocked that he did that. He said he knows, it's, he knows the prophecy is a prophecy about Jesus Christ. And he knows that the Bible is interchanging the name David for Christ. But yet he uses the word David because he didn't like what the scripture had to say about the firstborn. And so, he gave a, a reference to Psalms 89. Let's go to Psalms 89. And I went to Psalms 89, and I read the particular verse that he was coming from. He was coming from verses 27. He says, Also I will make him my firstborn, higher than the kings of the earth. Basically, he shall be king of kings and lord of lords. We know that. But when I read verses 27... I, I began to realize that the rest of Psalms, chapter 89, was beautiful. And so I said, let me read again from the beginning, so I'm not taking out of context. Let me read again from the beginning. And, I, and as I read all the way through, the Lord began to open up my eyes. Not, and not, he, the Lord did not give me a word, but the Lord opened up my eyes to the word. Said, hey, Rob, yeah, you're the pastor, yeah, you need to know what this says. Hey, Rob, yeah, you're the preacher, yeah, you still don't know your Bible enough. <laughs> and Sister, Sister, Sister Mata, very few people can have that discipline. I need to learn that discipline. So I've gone out and I've given you all these scriptures that talk about firstborn because I've, I've told you over and over what firstborn meant and I want you to have that so no one can deceive you. My job as a minister is, is to give you resources, not just say to you go and search it up, but I mean I can say that to you, but also give you resources that you can have, you can put in your hand and you can say, okay, the Bible says this, the Bible says that, the Bible says this. You can prove it for yourself. 
I don't want anybody to walk, around, walk away from here with a faith that they got from me. Do not walk away with a faith you got from me. You need to walk away with a faith that you get from the Word. Everybody say the Word. The word. Of God. Faith comes by? And hearing by Pastor Robert. Hearing by the Word of God. Okay. So, we're going to take... I can give you the degree to which it's been revealed to me. We're going to take Psalms 89 this morning. And sometimes I preach and sometimes I teach and I go in between both. Sometimes Jordan reads. That's a psalm. I'll let you guys read this for yourself. It's more like a personal thing. You go, you sit down, and you just look it up yourself. I've got some homework in there for you as well. Okay? I want you guys to just, I just gotta, I just gotta preach. I can't be interrupted by anybody. When I get interrupted, I make mistakes. <laughs> I say things that I don't want to say. Eh? Yeah, we read that one already. Yeah, okay. Okay. So we're going to divide this into three pieces. We're going to go Psalms 89 verses 1 to 18 or 19. And we're going to talk it up. We're going we're gonna, to we're call that part Christ in his glory. Then from 20, we're going to go from 20 to 37, and we're going to call that the earthly ministry of Christ. And then we're going to go from, you'll see it break down beautifully, 37, 38 to the end, we're going, to, we're, going to, we're going to call that part Christ on the cross. For oftentimes, the Bible, Jesus says one time, he says, search the scriptures. Search the word of God, for they testify of me. And the psalmist who wrote this one here, it's a, it, it's a, it, it's a psalm of, uh, of masculine of Etham, the Ezraite. The Ezraite. They are inspired by God, and the Bible said that they are prophesying when they're writing these words. They're not just making them up, but they're being, the Bible says that the, that the word of God is of no secret. It's, it's of no secret interpretation. No pastor should come and tell you an interpretation that does not, is not consistent with the word of God. If you sit there and let me give you an interpretation that is inconsistent with the word of God, shame on you. You're not showing any kind of loyalty to me. Your loyalty is not to be with the pastor. Your loyalties are to be with the word of God. And so are mine. So if I'm saying something which is not correct in the word of God, pull me aside. Give me a, a little while to, to, to get my... Because oftentimes, Brother George, my, my, my brain is going to be in 89. You can bring me to this place, that place, but my brain is not there. So I am in 89. I'll bring you around a few places, but uh, there's a particular stream of thought from that I'm trying to bring to you that when you come to me afterwards, I'll be able to answer you later on, but it's going to be difficult at that time because I will make mistakes. Okay? Psalm 89, verses 1 says this. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. Capital L, capital O-R-D, Yahweh. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. For I have said mercy... Now, I want you, if you, if you if, to underline it mentally, or if you've got a pen, underline the word faithfulness. Faithful. Everybody say faithfulness. faithfulness. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. And then again, verses 2, thy faithfulness. Everybody say faithfulness. faithfulness. Shall, ex, uh, shall thou establish in the heavens. I shall make known thy faithfulness and thy faithfulness in verses 2 shall thou shall thou establish in the heavens so in the heavens god is known as the one who is faithful so no matter what you go through regardless of how difficult it is and the bible says i think in the book of job it says faithful are the faithful are the wounds of a friend so if you're God's friend and something bad happens to you, there's got to be a reason why he's allowed it to you, and it's got to be for a good reason, because God is, everybody say, God is faithful. Say, in heaven, on the throne, 
God is faithful. So when you take that word faithful, if you understand that that is talking about one of the very great characteristics of the Most High God, and you go over to, in your Bible, you go over to the book of Revelations. God isn't just called faithful, but God has a name in heaven. Uh, Revelations 19 and verses 11. He said, Thou would establish thy faithfulness in, in where? In heaven. Now it says, I saw that same heaven, I saw a heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. It is not to be mistaken with the white horse of Revelation chapter 6. That's the false, that's the Antichrist. Need to know more? Come and see me. He said, and he that sat upon him was called, what was his name? Small f, capital F. I know there's no capital, but to emphasize, that's a name that's given to him. His name is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness, he does judge and he makes war. So I want you to understand that the name Faithful, which is applied to God in heaven, and the name faithful, which is ascribed to God in heaven, and the title of the faithful one, which is ascribed to God in heaven, is going to be transferred into Jesus Christ. And you'll find in your scriptures as you go through it that there's so many things which are, which are, which are for God, which are ascribed to Christ. And guys, there is, no, there is nothing in scripture which is ascribed to God that does not belong to Christ or to Christ that does not belong to God. So Christ is our Savior, but who is our Savior? God is our Savior. Okay. He says this in verses 3, I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David my servant. Now you see, you can think that's David, this, the guy who slew Goliath. And if you interpret it as being David, <laughs> I like one time in the book of Acts, when, uh, let's, let's go to the book of Acts, just because we're, we know the word of God, we can, we can reference things back and forth. In the book of Acts, day of Pentecost, <laughs> David, David said, Verses 20, Acts chapter 2, verses 27, David said, Because thou will not, <laughs> David, David is speaking, and he said, Because thou will not leave my soul in hell, neither will thou suffer thine, everybody say, Holy One. Holy. Neither will thou suffer my, thine Holy One to see corruption. Let's go down to verses 25. It says, For David speaketh concerning him. When David said, I foresaw the Lord always before my face. He is on my right hand. Everybody say right hand. Right. Get used to that word in scripture. That I should not be moved. When, he, when David said he's at my right hand, it means he's, he's my power, he's my strength, he's my savior, he's my glory. He does not literally mean that God is on his right hand. And as you read through that, you'll see that that word right hand has been manipulated and twisted by theologians and scholars to make you think that God has two sides, a right side and a left side. The Bible doesn't say right side or left side. It says right hand. The Jewish term is right hand. Now, I, I, I explained that in the body of that, uh, the, the, the hand that I gave you. The new word, any, anybody say hello in modern terminology? What do you say to say hello? No, 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 hi. Who said that? Michael, what's up? What's up? Well, everyone knows that. You know, young guys, we say, I say that. I'm a young guy, too, so, you know. <laughs> Brother George, I, I like to be, think I'm a young guy. Hey, Kelvin, what's up? I was like, I don't know. What is <laughs> if you say what's up, do you mean up? You don't 
coming up. What's up has nothing to do with up. It's a term in our modern language that just means, how you going? Hi, hello, what's up? What's up? What's up, Tremaine? If I say to you, what's up, and you go, I don't know, what's up? what is up? There'd be something wrong with you. In today's world, when people read the word right hand of God in scripture, and they're thinking about the right hand side of God, they're, mixed, they're mixing up that terminology. They don't understand the meaning of it. What, the right hand of God is just a place of power. God is infinite in nature. Only a finite thing has left and right. Therefore, it stops to the left and stops to the right. God don't stop. God is infinite in his nature. He's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. You can't tell which side is left or right because he does never end. <laughs> you don't know if you're on the left-hand side or the right-hand side because he's endless. <laughs> and all things is inside of him. Now, guys, listen to me. Listen to me. So when you're using the word right hand of God, the terminology is used in the same way as we use now what's up. Don't think of a direction. Think of what it what's actually meaning. Now, you see, I can say that, but when the Bible tells you what right hand means, and you're a scholar, and you're a theologian, and you know what the Bible says, for even a fool should not make a mistake about what right hand means. But yet the theologians and the scholars who teach people and go to seminar, seminaries and teach people there, yet those men will tell people that the right hand of God meant the right hand side. Which is, I, I think, deceitful. Because they know it doesn't mean that. They know it does not mean that. Every theolo and, and I say that they're liars, a strong word, but Christ says, I, he says, um, Tammy's song, how does it go? I would be a liar like unto you, but I know him and keep his sayings. He says, um, if I said that I didn't know him, John 8, 44, then I would be a liar like unto you, but I know him. You know. When you know him and you don't say what he is, you're a liar. I would be a liar like you if I said I didn't know him because I know him. And they know the word, but yet they still come and tell you it's the right-hand side. It's not true. It's deceitful. I think it's deceitful. Or they allow you to think that. I think every pastor, regardless of your denomination, you have the right to come and stand before your congregation, and you should say to your congregation, when you see the word right hand, you're the, she you're the sheep, I'm the shepherd. When you see the word right hand, it doesn't mean right-hand side. But yet there are translations of the Bible that actually says the right-hand side of God. Are you kidding me, man? Do you desperately want your doctrines to have a foundation so badly that you're going to change the right hand of God to right-hand side? If you want to read it, it's in there. I'm sure there are others that say it. Okay. So when you read about the right hand of God, okay, so David is speaking. Let's get back to my, to my topic again here. For, verse 25, for David uh, speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh, my flesh also rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me thy ways of, the, 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 the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Uh -huh. Who is speaking? David. But David is not speaking about himself. He is speaking about Jesus. So here is Paul very boldly, you know, and, and they have their scriptures, they've read their Bible. He says, men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, of, of, the, of, the, of the patriarch David, that he is dead, <laughs> rotted, corrupted, in a grave. And he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us 
unto this day. I love that. He said, now you read about, you see, David's talking. David sounds like he's talking about himself. Well, guess what? I have, I have something to tell you. When it's talking about David, it's not always talking about the man. It's actually talking about Christ. And the Bible says a lot of things about Christ that you need to ascribe to Christ. Okay, so I'm going to race through because I've got so much to say in the entire chapter. Let's go back to eight, Psalms 89 again. I might miss a few things, but, you know. He says this. Now, listen to this. He says, um, I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David my servant. Thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. Now, everybody needs to understand. The throne of David. Where is the throne of David? Now, I am not talking about, listen to me today. I'm talking to Christians. Where is the throne of David? today it's where it's in heaven where is Israel's king who is who is Israel's king where does he sit no no he says on the right hand of, no. if Israel's king is on the throne then the throne of Israel's king is in heaven and the one upon that throne is a man called Jesus. Listen to me. It is God upon the throne, but God cannot sit on a throne because God is infinite. Oh, Pastor Rob, do you have to preach doctrine again? Yes, I do. For the days shall come that they shall not endure sound doctrine. It's like, it's like I'm taking you and pinching your skin and you're just hurting because you just want to talk. About, we want to hear about something really fluffy and nice and sweet. But doctrine, that's how the devil destroys churches, by people wanting candy floss and fairy fluff for, for church and not sound words of the scriptures that teaches them about Christ. That's how churches die. Let's stay in the word and you know you'll be fine. If you stay in the word, you, everybody say, if you stay in the word, in the word. you'll be fine. Be fine. <laughs> okay. Listen to this. He says, he says this, he's, that, that he's on his throne. Um, and, thy, and thy throne to all generations. Now, hmm, Pastor Robert, what do you mean by the throne of David is in heaven? That doesn't make any sense. And, and why, are you calling, why are you calling Jesus God? He's not God, he's God's son. Yes, he's God's son, but he's also God. <laughs> and there are not two gods, for he is God in a human form. He is God made manifested. He is God taken on human flesh to come to die. When the book of Hebrews, let's go to Hebrews now. Let's go to Hebrews. Are you preaching or doing a Bible study? I'm giving you sound doctrine. If I was coming up with candy, flary, fluff ideas, they would all come out of my mind and I wouldn't go in the Word of God. You wouldn't have to turn to know your Bible. I want God's church to be what God intended His church to be. A place where he is glorified and not me and my, my brilliant ideas. Listen, when, listen, listen, listen to where, what he says in, in, um, in verses 5. He says, verses, Hebrews 1 verses 5. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, thou art my son, this that I have begotten thee, and again I, sh I will be to him a father. Everybody say, he shall be to him a? And, and he shall be to me a? Ooh, I like that. Get there in a second. And again, who is speaking by the way? God. God is speaking. And again, when he bringeth the first begotten or the firstborn into the world, he said, and let all the, a let all the angels of God do what? Let all the angels of God worship. But I thought only God is to be worshipped. Jesus is he's a man, no? Jesus is not a man. Jesus is God <laughs> in a human form. Yes, he's a man, but you better look past his humanity. Yes, he's a man, but if you're stuck on his humanity, hey, by the way, the Muslims, they also believe that, that Christ was a man that came to earth. We, we got to believe more than that. They believe he was a prophet. They give him some praise and some exaltation. But God's church has to be able to glorify Christ a little bit higher than another religion. So yes, he is glorified in the Muslim faith, in, in, in the Muslim religion. He is, he is glorified there. And he is, he is called, he is, Sister Fatmata, you were you're formerly a Muslim, and he, Christ is respected in that religion. And they know he's coming back and they exalt him. Well, guess what, guys? You as Christians, you've, you've got to exalt Jesus higher than the Muslim faith. 
And the higher you, you exalt him, yes, we believe that he's a prophet. We believe that he was sent from God. We believe he came from the heaven. And by the way, so do the Muslims. They, do, they write that in their Bible. I even think they believe he was immaculately conceived. They do. In their Bible, Christ was immaculately conceived. In their Bible, Christ was a prophet. Are you trying to tell me that God's church has an equivalent testimony as the Muslim faith and that's it, we can't go any higher than that? That the Bible gives no greater testimony of Christ than what the Muslim faith has of Christ? For what you know of Christ, they also know of Christ. And what you say of Christ, they also say. In, in, it, well, okay, okay, in, in, in some degree, but I'm talking about his exaltation. He's come back with other prophets, and they all come down together. But our Bible tells us something about Jesus that is quite unique. For Thomas looked at Jesus, and Thomas said something that was not written in the Quran, when he said unto Jesus, my my Lord and my God. When he looks at a man and calls him God, there's got to be a reason why you would call him God. That is not, that's where the church has to be exalting more than other religions and faith. Because there are other religions who also accept Jesus as being some kind of a, a Messiah, as some kind of a teacher, a preacher. But we're not saying he's a Messiah, our Savior. He's not just the anointed one. We're saying that he is actually God in a human form, come to earth to experience death and to taste death for all men. Amen? Okay, so God testifying of Christ, God says this. Then again, he bringeth the, the first begotten into the world, and he said, let all the angels of God worship him. Anybody said, say, why that man is always talking about this? Why does he preach something else? I'm going to preach it until you get it, until it's in your soul, until it's part of your core. I'm going to preach it until you know. Because the Bible says that, he says, you don't know me. Who am I? Oh, thou art this, thou art that. Every Christian going to church, they jump up and down, they don't know who. How many Christians going up in church? All they go to church for is to jump up and down, roll on the ground, speak in tongues, and get feel fuzzy. But open up your Bible and tell me what it says. They don't know. How can you save anybody with your, with your roll on the ground and you're jumping and you're fuzzy? That's wonderful for you. You're edified. But to edify me, you need the word of God. To edify the lost, you need the word of God. Because they're going to ask you, hey, by the way, remember Shane? Shane was in a Catholic church, okay? I, I don't mean to uh, any, any, any insult to anybody, but you know, let, me, let me say that today. And while he is there in that church, he hears them say that Jesus Christ is God, but he can't understand. He's like, how can this man be God? How can this man be God? Why do you call this man God? And he said, look, you know, Rob, he, he got Shane got baptized about three weeks ago in our, one of our Tuesday services. He said, on, I was invited by, uh, by Alex to come to church. And as I sat down, you began to talk about Jesus being God. And you began to explain why you call this man God. And he told me, he said, we sat outside and talked for a while. He said, Robert, all of my life, I have never become a Christian. I would never commit to the Christian faith. I did not want to become a Christian because I know that God is a spirit. But yet I hear people calling Jesus God. This young lady, was, uh, she was in the Muslim faith when somebody came to her and told her Jesus Christ is God. And she couldn't understand. They just told her he's God, but no explanation for how you can call this man God. And so when she was in the Muslim faith and in her country in Africa, she said to God, if you could ever explain to me how this Jesus could be God, the Son of God. Is that what they said to you? Then... It, and we, they say he's something, but we don't believe he's the Son of God. As a Muslim, he didn't believe yet. So she said, if you could ever, if you could ever explain to me... That's what she said to God. If you could ever convince me who just Jesus is, I will follow him. So she, you know, I like, you know, she thought she just said it, right? But God's like, mm-hmm. I heard you. End up at church one day. And when she ended up there, she went... What did he say? And as I explained, she understood. And as I explained, Shane understood. And Shane said, finally, someone can actually explain to me why this man deserves the title of God. Okay. Listen to this. That's why, that's why we have to explain. Because people need to be saved. And my jumping and my tongue and my rolling does not save you. <laughs> Thank God for the Holy Ghost. 
But you can have all the Holy Ghost you want. If you don't have the word in your head, you can't save nobody. And if the Holy Ghost you have doesn't take you into this word back and forth and back and forth, if all the Holy Ghost you have makes you roll around and jump and talk in tongues, how, what are you going to do with that? Who are you going to save? Hmm. So yes, roll around, jump and speak in tongues all you want, but make sure you have this. Listen to me, listen to me. He says here, he said, Lord, all the angels of God worship him. So only God is to be worshipped, but yet God says the first begotten should be worshipped as though he were God. Hmm, interesting. Okay, and all the angels, and, and of the angels, he said, who maketh his angel spirit and his ministers a flame, uh, um, a, a, a flame of fire. Everybody read together. But unto the Son. Now, hang on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over here to, uh, to, to Psalms again. Hang on there. I'm going to go over here to Psalms again. He says, I will establish forever and build up thy, everybody say thy throne. That's Psalms 89.4. I got a ways to go. Oh, Lord, help me. And build up thy throne to all generations. When God uses the word thy throne in this, in this prophecy about Christ, when God himself is speaking, again, in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 8, he said, but unto the Son he saith, what? He, he says, thy throne. What throne are you talking about? If you're not talking about the throne of Christ as being the throne of God, what throne are you talking about? For God said, his throne is my throne. For he is me. Before Abraham was, Christ said, I am. So Christ said, I am Yahweh. And Yahweh says, I am him. I am Jesus. God is saying, I am Jesus in a human body. Don't mistake who I am. For the Lord himself shall give you a sign. And a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son. And his name shall be called Emmanuel. And the angel interpreted and the angel said, that means God is with us. What God? He's just a man. No, he's more than a man. For he's the word from the beginning who was with God and he was God. He deserves. Everybody say he deserves the title of God, of Lord. Now, thy throne, O God, saith, because God is testifying of Christ. He is not, not of another, not of, a, of another being, a secondary being. God is testifying of Christ. Thy throne is, is the throne in heaven is the throne of Christ. I like the song when it said, down from his glory. Ever living story, my God and Savior came, and Jesus was his name. Down from his glorious throne, down from his glory. Mm. Okay. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of thy kingdom. Are we going to talk about that some more? Let's go back over to Psalms 89 again. Let's keep going. Yeah. Okay, he says this, that he says, for who in heaven can be compared unto the Lord? <laughs> who among the sons of the mighty is likened unto the Lord? What Lord is he talking about? Hmm, I don't know. Let me reveal to you a secret that you can take home and you can put it in the bank. No one can see God. I didn't say no man. I said no being can see God. At any time. Or in any place. The only way for you to see God is for God to make himself manifested to you. For God is to be, listen to me, because God is too big to be seen. Number one, he's invisible. So he's not like, he's not like, he's, he's like you know, like, if I can make myself in not seeing, God can still see me. Are there angels here? They're invisible. <laughs> right? But guess who can see them? But who sees God? 
God's not a, God is not a spirit like an angel is a spirit, like an invisible spirit. God is an infinite spirit. They're finite spirits. God is an uncreated spirit. They're created spirits. So even though, shh, even though they're visible spirits, even though they're invisible spirits, they're not invisible because of the reason that God is. Because <laughs> God can still see them. But I'm going to say again, no one can see God. If you went up to heaven, if you ever been to heaven, oh, this is good. You go to heaven, and there's a man upon the throne of heaven. <laughs> can I bore you for a second? Sit right there, just for a second, my brother. If you went up into heaven, and there's a man upon the throne in heaven. <laughs> this is good. And all the angels are gathered around, worshiping and magnifying around his throne, and giving him praise and saying, There's none likened unto you, O Lord. Who in heaven is likened unto thee? Who among the, the sons of men, who among your creation is likened unto you? And you go up into heaven, and you walk up there, and you said, um, Excuse me? No, no, no. Where, where's God? What did you, you just giggled at me? I think he'll giggle at you like that. Like. <laughs> Thank you, my brother. What? Didn't you have a pastor? Didn't you have a pastor who told you what to expect in heaven? Your pastor is telling you that when you get to heaven, don't expect to see God. Because God is not a being that you can apprehend with your eyes. You can only see God as Christ. And he that has seen me, what did Jesus say? He that has seen me has seen God. I know I'm only my glory, I know I'm not on my throne, but the day shall come when the sun shall turn to darkness and the moon shall turn to blood, and you shall see me coming in the heavens with my glory upon the throne of God with the saints of God and the angels of God. Then when I'm there, you'll ask me, show me God. Well, let the pastor teach you today. If you've seen Jesus, you've seen God. So when the Bible's talking about God and he's likened, you can't, you don't know what God's like to liken him. You can only know what God's like because of what he revealed himself as. And he revealed himself in heaven before time as a glorious being. He dwells in a light. What? Come on, let's go to 1 Timothy. Second, is it 2 Timothy dash? He dwells in a light which no man can approach onto. Let's talk about this Jesus. 1 Timothy? Let's go to 1 Timothy, chapter 6. <laughs> Verses 14. That thou keep his command, that thou keep this commandment without spot unrebukable unto the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Who in his times he shall show you who is the blessed and only potentate, the king. Who is the only potentate, the king? Who is the only potentate? Jesus, the king of kings. For the Bible said he had what? He had a name written, king of kings and lord of, lord, lord of lords. The king of kings and the lord of lords. Listen about this. In heaven, in heaven. Who only has immortality. Which this Jesus, Jesus who only has immortality, doing what? Dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto. <laughs> who no man has seen nor can see. <laughs> to whom be honor and, and, and power everlasting. And, and, some, and someone would say, oh, but Paul saw shining light. No. Paul saw a little dim bulb. <laughs> what did Paul see when he got blinded? Paul saw heaven's flashlight. God took one of them little pocket flashlights. You know them little pocket flashlights you have to get your key in your door at nighttime? Them little flashlights? <laughs> Hey, hey, oh, oh, what about when he illuminated himself upon the mountain and he became like unto light? What about then? No, 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 no. that was just a, that was just a, a headlights. I have a high beam on your thing. 
That's, that's all you can, when you see Jesus in his glory, all you can stand is the high beams. You know you're driving in the country and you're in darkness? A guy puts his high, it's in them big trucks, put the high beams on, you can't see nothing. Oh, the light is so great. Am I right or wrong? So you one day let that same truck driver put his high beam on when the sun is shining. You don't even notice it. Because the light of the sun makes his headlight. It's just when you're in darkness, <laughs> it's bad. Oh, you're blinding me, you're blinding me. <laughs> that's a transfiguration. When, when Paul met Christ, that's just a flashlight. Flashlight, headlights, God's glory. It's not to be compared, okay? When Christ comes in his glory, you're going to see something. When you see him around the throne, he said, I shall come with my Father's glory. And every eye shall see. You better start glorifying him now, because that's what I'm trying to do. That's what the Holy Ghost is trying to get you to do in the church. Okay. And we want our children, you know, I like our children sit around the place and everything. Hey, Darian, sit with mom, that's really good. You know, we don't have Sunday school. Tash, you got your boy sitting next to you. Don't think he can't understand. You'll pick it up. Don't worry. You'll pick it up. Don't worry. Let, let him sit around the place. Let him play. You see, our, our kids are reading the scriptures here. Our kids are invested in the church. Let them read the scripture. My, my, my sister, I think, are we going to get your daughter to read next week? Yeah, we got to read. Next week you're reading. Everyone look at her so she knows they don't feel shy. Yeah. <laughs> Looking at you, you're going to read. You know why? Because you grew up in our church. From a little baby, you grew up in our church. You're a part of us. You're, she's invested in us. Why should we treat her like she's nothing? She's a part of us. Surely she can come here and she can read the word of God. All these young, all these young children are more innocent than all of you sinners. <laughs> I said that all these young children who come and read the Bible, they're more innocent than all you sinners saved by grace. <laughs> I'm like, why is the child reading? He's not even baptized yet or anything. You can't minister? Yeah, because you're a sinner. That's why you're saying that. And unless you become like one of these, you can't become. When you get to 18, 19, you've got to kind of hold them back a bit. You need to go get baptized because, you know, sin will only leave you alone for so long. You know? Anyway, let me stay in the Word. Let me stay in the Word. Back, back to something again, guys. So he says this, God is great to be feared in the assembly of the saints. He is to be had in reverence of all them that are about him, that are about him. O Lord God of hosts, who is a strong Lord like unto thee, or of thy faithfulness round about thee. Again, that word faithfulness. The, thou rulest the, the raging of the sea. When the waves thereof arise, thou stillest them. And Christ says, peace be still. I am that God. The God who said, peace be still to the raging sea when he was on earth, the man who said that is that God. Thou hast rebuked Rahab, Egypt, in pieces. Thou hast broken Rahab in pieces and one, as one that is slain. Thou hast scattered thine enemies with a strong arm. The heavens are thine. Oh, I love that. The heavens are thine. The earth also is thine. As ever I say, they're thine. Why do we think they belong to Christ? Why do you think the heavens belong to Christ? Well, if you go to Hebrews again, really quickly. Everybody say, thine. Okay. When you go to Hebrews again, and you read verse chapter 1 again, where God is testifying of this man called Jesus, he says this, um, Hebrews 1, um, for the heavens of the... Um, verse 10, he says, and God is talking, he says, and thou, Lord, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, all things were. The same was in the beginning, with God, all things were made by Him. So God truly testifies and says, I did it as Christ, by Christ and through Christ. And thou, Lord, in the beginning has laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hand. God is speaking, and he's testifying of the thine. Who made the heavens? So when he's talking here, don't think it's another being, because God wants you to know. I, God has only ever done anything by and as Christ. God has been operating by Christ since the beginning, as Christ in the beginning. So when you give this glory, you can't give a glory to God that Christ doesn't get. It's not biblical. Everybody say, you cannot give a glory to Christ. That, sorry, you cannot give a glory to God that Christ cannot get. 
If you got a glory, you see, in the Muslim faith, they have a glory for God, which Christ can't get. How dare you if you're a Christian? How dare you? With the knowledge of this word, how dare you have a, have a glory reserved only for God that Christ doesn't get? And what glory can you give to Christ that God doesn't get? For God says, when I'm glorified, you're glorified. And when you're glorified, I'm glorified. Because I am you and you are me. I'm going to keep going. What's thine is mine and what's mine is thine. Okay, thank you, my brother. Okay. He, he then goes on and he says, The north and the south thou hast created them, Tabor and Hermon, east and west, north and south, okay, shall rejoice in thy faith. It means the whole, the whole earth. North and south, east and west, Tabor and Hermon, okay? Um, thou, thou hast, thou, um, thou, okay, now here's where it gets it. It says, Thou hast a mighty arm. Oh, wow. Do you think that Jesus has been working out? I like walking up to my sons at some time. They're, they're in the mirror and they're, they're you know, they're like Jerry. You know, he's getting, he starts getting some muscles now. He goes in the mirror, he's like, uh, uh, uh. And I, I kind of pull to him. I have a mightier arm than him. And some other guy comes up to me and goes, move over my arm. You know? The mighty arm doesn't mean your arms. It means the power to both save and to judge. It also means glory. So, first of all, when he's, when he's talking here about the arm of the Lord, he's talking about glory. Thou hast a mighty arm, strong is thy hand, and high is thy right hand. Don't think of a hand. It means power to save, power to judge, or glorious. And when he's talking about Christ in his glory, he says he has a strong arm with a mighty hand. <laughs> I'm going to keep racing here. But then he's going to talk about Christ as a savior. So I'm going to keep going now, quick now. He says, Thou hast a mighty arm, strong is thy, is thy hand, and high is thy right hand. Justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Mercy and truth shall go before thee. Blessed is the people that know the joyful sound. They shall walk, O Lord, in the light of thy countenance, for he is the light that shineth in the darkness. Anyway, in thy name they shall rejoice all the day. The name of the Lord is a strong tie. That name is Jesus, for there's no other name that's been given unto us. Now, Keep going again. And in, and in thy righteousness shall they be exalted, for thou art the glory of their strength. And in thy, and in thy favor our horns shall be exalted. For the, Lord God, for the Lord is our defense, and the Holy One of Israel is our King. Jesus is called the Holy One. And when he died, they called him the King. The, Israel is coming back. Thy King cometh. When he comes back from heaven, he comes back a King. He came as a servant. The first time, but when he comes again, he comes back as a king. Okay. Keep going. Now we're going to transition because everything you read before was Christ or God as Christ. Ever say God as Christ? God by Christ? God through Christ? Let's not say God by Christ it, by anymore as if it's a singular thing. Let's say God by Christ, through Christ, as Christ. Because one, they're distinctive and they're unique in what they're saying. They're saying, I'm not just saying that Jesus did it. I'm saying God did it through him. But I'm also saying God did it as him. And I'm also saying God did it by him. So I'm not going to settle for one. I'm going to use them all. Because they're all true. But if I just use one, then I'm not giving you the balance of the scripture right. You might not see what you should see. I got to do my job. You guys pay me to do my job, so I better do it better than I ever have. <laughs> so now he's going to transition now. He says, Then thou spakest in a vision to the Holy One, and saidest, I have laid upon one that is mighty. I have exalted one chosen out of thy people. I have found David my servant, and with my, oil, with my holy oil I have anointed him. Who is this talking about? He's talking about Jesus. Let's go over to let's go over to um, let's go over to the book of Jeremiah chapter thirty. Jeremiah chapter thirty, I do believe. 
hope I'm right. Jeremiah, yeah, let's go to Jeremiah 30. I'm going to give you some new scriptures as well. I'll give you guys some old scriptures and give you some new ones. Am I in Jeremiah 30? Yeah. Mm. Let's look at this here. David, okay, guys, Jeremiah is prophesying. Let me explain to you guys in case you don't know. Listen to me carefully here. David reigned and lived about 1000 BC. From 1000 BC, you start going down. 1900, 800, 700. See, you go down until you get to, the, to Christ. Then at Christ, you start going 100, 200. Now we're up to 2000. So you went down to Christ, and then from Christ, you go back up again. Okay? So David lived about 1000 BC. Listen here. Jeremiah lived about 560. So 450 years after David is dead and gone, the Holy Ghost is still talking about David. Now, preacher, it don't mean David, because David is dead. And there are some preachers who say, yes, in the end of time, God will raise up King David again. No, he's not. <laughs> okay? It's called Jesus. Listen to me. But they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king. Hang on for a second. Who could this possibly be? They shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will rise up unto them. <laughs> Jeremiah 30 verses 9. I'm in verse 8. For it shall come to pass in that day, said the Lord of hosts, that I will break this yoke from off thy neck and will burst thy bonds, and, and strangers shall no more serve themselves of him. But they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I shall rise up unto them. But what's interesting now is when you go to, let's go to Jeremiah 23 in verses 5. Let's go to, just back a little bit, Jeremiah 23. Let's talk about some prophecies of Christ. So in that, Jeremiah 23, <laughs> verse, I'm in verse 4. And I will set up shepherds over them, which shall feed, ever say, feed them. And they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. Behold, what's a shepherd's job to do? He is to feed you. With what? With, with his ideas? Okay. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise up. Who? But hang on for a second. God is talking, and God made a mistake. Because, or maybe he's going to raise King David from the dead. And his sepulchre is still with us, you know? Say it again. Amen. So they all say, oh, son of Jesus, thou son of David. Is Jesus David's son? Like, did, G did David give birth to Jesus? No. The word son means that one who is part of his, um, of his lineage. The son of, sir, it's a lineage of. So we're all sons of Adam, black, white, pink, purple, because we're of the lineage of Adam. Okay. That's how we're all brothers. Hey, bro. Hey, bro. <laughs> okay. Listen to this. I will raise up David a, a righteous, I will raise up to David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. Listen to this carefully. <laughs> in his days... Judah shall be saved. I can go to all that. All these things I'm reading have a reference to Revelation and parts of Scripture. But to save time, I'll just keep going on. I've got 10 minutes. In his days, Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name whereby he shall be called. And the Bible says, Thou shalt call his name Jesus. Or it says, A virgin shall, shall bring forth a, a son, and, and his name shall be called Emmanuel. Or it says, For until the child is born, and a, and a child is given, and his name shall be called? His name shall be called? Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So you see, we know that his name is going to be called all those things. But here is one in big, in big bold letters in your, in your Bible, which is a shock to you. It's like, oh, he's called that, is he? And his name shall be called? I said, his name whereby he shall be called. What? 
Who is it talking about? What does it call him? The capital L-O-R-D. Our righteousness. And Christ said, there's none righteous, there's none good but God. Why do you call me good? Because you're God. Ah, good answer. Okay. So everybody learn Jeremiah 23. Is that a new one for you? It's a new one for me. <laughs> I never said his name shall be called the Lord. I never used that one. You know, I got, I got stuck on, <laughs> oh, hallelujah, I got stuck on, uh, you know, uh, Isaiah chapter 7, verses 14, hallelujah, I'm really deep. I, I, got, I got stuck on Isaiah 9, you know. Come on, can we, can we go, did, there's probably so much more that we don't understand that we need to dig into. That's my job to dig into and come back and show you names for God, okay? We'll get to that one these days. Okay, back to Psalms again, because i got to finish his earthly ministry. Now, listen, here's where God is making all the, first thing is glory, God makes all these glorious promises to him. Glorious promises. Listen to this, listen to this. He says this. Um, I have found David, I'm just going to keep reading for a while. I have found David, verses 20, verses, uh, as, um, uh, Psalms 89, 20. I'm just trying to rush through here. I have found David my servant with my holy oil. I have anointed him. He's called the Messiah, which means the, the anointed one. Okay. With, um, with whom my hand, your hand, what's it? My hand shall be established. What does he mean by your hand, right? When, when God says my hand shall be established with him, what does it mean? My power, my salvation, or my judgment. Always one of those. Okay, it shall, shall be established, mine arm also shall strengthen him. The, the, the enemy shall not exact upon him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. Notice how it goes from the first 20, from I, 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 now it talks about him, him, him in a lot more terms, okay? It, it, makes, a, it makes a switch to show you that something has, something has happened, there's a change now. And I will beat down his foes before his face and plague them that hate him. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him. And in my name shall his horn be exalted. I will set his in the and his right hand in the rivers. Let's go over to the book of Numbers. Let's go to the book of Numbers. Um, is it Numbers? Are we going to go over to, yeah, Numbers 24. Let's go to Numbers 24. Read Numbers 24. It's really interesting. Listen to how you, you have to handle that word. When you, when you read the word seas and you read the word rivers and waters, look what it means. Numbers 24, verse 7 says this. Wrong place. Numbers 24, verse 7 says this. This is, um, this is um, Balaam prophesying for Balak. He wants, him, he wants him to curse Israel. He begins to prophesy about Israel's future glory. He says this, verse 6, as the, valleys, as the valleys are they spread forth as gardens by the river's side, as the trees of, 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 uh, of L-I-G-N, Lainholov, sounds, I'm not sure. Got to work on that one. Which the Lord has planted as cedar, as cedar trees before the waters, he shall pour the water out of his bucket, and his seed, everybody say his seed, seed. shall be in many waters, and his kingdom shall be higher and, and, uh, uh, than Agag, and his kingdom, where, where are his children going to be? His children are going to be where? In many Many waters. It's a prophecy of Christ. When you take, and waters represent nations, kingdoms. Okay? Okay. So when you go back over to Isaiah now, word upon word, line upon line, precept upon precept, huh? in, in Psalms, thank you. When you go to Psalms now, and you, when you said, when you said, God says, and um, I will make him, uh, sorry, uh, I will set his hand also in the sea and his right hand in the rivers. It means that from all the sources that there are for water, God is going to be drawing his children from those places. Christ is going to bring them from everywhere. His children are everywhere. His seed is everywhere. His seed is black, white, pink, purple. He doesn't care. My house should be called a house of prayer for all nations. Just hang on there. Hang in there. Endure sound doctrine. Oh, I got to go and eat now, Pastor Robert. 
My cooking is going really good in your sound doctrine. I'm getting hungry now. Because you know, after about an hour, the flesh has to go, this is a bit long. <laughs> hey, flesh, you want to get saved? You want God to save you? Hey, soul, tell your flesh, quiet, I want to get saved, man. Leave that chicken alone. It's going to cook. It'll cook. It'll cook it. You're going to have supper. Don't worry. He says this. He shall cry unto me, thou art. And what did Christ always say? I, God is my father. He always says God is his father. Why is that? Because God created Christ to be God. He created him to be himself. He created him to be. Go read your scripture. It tells you that clearly. He is the firstborn of creation. <laughs> he wasn't just there. God made him to be there. God said, I am going to be him, and he is going to be me. You see him, you see me. Okay. God is, everybody, God is not a man. I'm going to say it again. God is not a man. I'm going to say it again. God is not a man. That man called Jesus, whether on earth or in heaven, is a man. God is a spirit, and that spirit has to explain why he's manifesting like this man. Why, why, is this man called, why is this man called God? Because from the beginning, I made him to be myself. So you can see me. So you can touch me. So you created things can have fellowship with a created thing. But don't think that created thing is not me. That's what the Jews would say. But he's born in a manger. He's just a little boy. We can slap him. We can crucify him. He's still God. That's why I said, you don't think right now I can, I can pray to my father? And he can call a legion of angels and destroy all of you? Don't think I'm limited because I'm limiting myself. I'm not limited because I'm limiting myself. He's still God. <laughs> He's still God. That's why he can say, thy sins be forgiven thee. Anyway. Listen to this. He should say, my father, and the rock of my salvation, I will also make him my firstborn. We know what that means. We went there last week. Colossians 1.15, higher than the kings of the earth. My mercy will I keep for him forever, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. All the promises, great promises, right, guys? God is making great promises. He shall not leave my soul in hell. But lots, of, lots of promises. But that's what happens here. He says, my mercy. Now, guys, please pay attention to verses 13. Let's go back to 13, 13 again. Give me 10 minutes. Speaking of God, he said, Thou hast a mighty arm, strong is thy hand. That's glory. Now, in your homework, in your homework, if you care to know your word, we have given you all the right hand scriptures. If you read the first one, you'll see it says, in Exodus 15, 6, the right hand, thy right hand, O Lord, is become glorious in power. And thy right hand, O Lord, has dashed in pieces thine enemies. So you can, you can write there, you can write for that first one, you can write power and thy, um, thy right hand, O Lord, has dashed an enemy in pieces. What does that mean? What's, what's God done if he's dashed in pieces the enemy? What has God done? He has what? Judged. And you're going to always find it's going to be power, glory, or judgment. Or salvation. But there is judgment. And as you go through, it's always saying the right hand of God. Not the hand, it's, it's representing something. Right hand is either representing glory, power, judgment, or salvation. Okay? So you can go through all the scriptures and they're all going to be saying something unique about one of those four. Always. You find something new, show it to me. We'll expand it to the church. Okay. Am I educating you? Yes. Am I doing my job? Yes. Okay. So I'm not just telling you. I want you to go to your Bible and see if what I'm saying is not true. You read and you see if that doesn't apply to one of those four all the time. Okay. Now listen. You see it says, Thou hast a mighty arm, strong is thy hand, and high is thy right hand. In 13, then talking of Christ, he says, I will set up his hand also in the sea. And in verses 25, sorry, in verses 25, I will set up his hand in the sea and his right hand in the rivers. So he's going to be saving people. Keep going down. So 13 is glory. 25 is salvation. The, the word right hand, okay? My mercy will I keep for him. Verse 28 says this. I'm going to be done in a second. My mercy will I keep for him 
forevermore, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. His seed also will, will I make to endure forever, and his throne as the days of heaven, that throne of God. If his children forsake my law and walk not in my judgments, if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, then I will visit their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. Nevertheless, my love and kindness will I not utterly take away from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. The church will, the church will always prevail. Okay, my covenant will I, will I not break, nor alter the thing that has gone out of my, my lips. Once have I sworn by my holiness that I will not lie to David, not physical David, okay? His seed shall endure forever, and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever as the moon, and as a faithful witness in heaven, Silah. Now, we're in verses... That's talking, about, that's talking about what Christ is going to be doing, what God is going to be doing in Christ, glorious. Now, everyone turn to verses 38, 38 now. What does it begin with? But. Everybody say but. It talks about Christ in uh, Ephesians 2, who were in dead and in trepidant and sin, but God who is rich in love. That but means that God is saying something really good, and now something really bad is going to come. Or God is saying something really bad. You naughty child. You shouldn't have done this. You shouldn't have done that. And oh, you did this. But I'm going to let it go. And when you hear that but, you go, oh, thank you. Because you know. They're describing what you've done. And you have to quicken who were dead in trespasses and sins. We're in times past. You walked according to the prison. Of the, the, same, the same spirit and our work in the, in the children of disobedience, among whom we've all had our conversation. In the lust of the flesh, and by nature, the children of wrath, even of others. But God. He's saying all the negative things. But God, who is rich in love, for his love already loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins. Ephesians 2. Okay. Listen to this. So that but now, it means that there's going to be a, a, a change. I'm watching you, time. I'm watching you. But thou was cast off and abhorred. Now you're going to talk about the suffering Christ. So Christ in his glory, promises made to him as Messiah, the anointed one on earth. But now you're talking about the Christ suffering, Christ on the cross, Christ being crucified, Christ being beaten, the enemy having the upper hand upon him. But thou hast cast off in the board, thou hast been wroth with thine anointed, the Messiah, thou hast made void the covenant of thy servant, thou hast profaned, is, 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 that was what? Thou hast profaned, verse, is, you know, thou hast profaned his crown by casting it to the ground like I'm no longer king. God has taken the, the glorious crown and replaced it with a crown of thorns. Woo! Thou hast broken on all the hedges, everything can come to him. Thou hast brought his strongholds to ruin. Listen to this. All that pass by him spoil him. He is a reproach to his neighbors. Listen to me now, church. I'm going to read a verse. You're going to tell me what this means. So the first one in 13 meant glory. Verses 25 means salvation. Right hand in 13, right hand in 25, right hand in 42. They're all being used. It's saying right hand, but it's always being used in a different way. You've got to know what it means in the way it's being used. This is what it says here. Thou hast set up the office. What does that mean? He's going to do what? He's going to give power unto his enemies. So before they had no power to take him, to crucify him. And he said, he said, he said you could do nothing except it was given to you of God. You have no power to do anything unto me except God had made you do it. But when, when the Bible says he has set up the right hand of his enemies, it means that God has empowered the, the forces of darkness now. They can take him now. They can crucify him now. His hour has come. Almost done. Thou hast made all his enemies to rejoice. Thou hast turned the edge of the sword and hast not made him to stand in the battle. Thou hast made his glory to cease. And thou hast cast his throne down to the ground. In the days of his use that thou shortened, and thou hast covered him with shame. You know why he did it? He did it for you. So God could have came and God could have been a glorious king. Christ could have come upon a, upon a, upon a great white stallion, but he came on a donkey, low and lowly. A king on a donkey. What? Behold, thy king cometh. 
He could have come in glory. He could have come in, in he could have come as all the things you read about in the first part of 39. He could have come and been exalted, but you know what he did? In order to save you, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be made equal to God, but he made himself, he made himself of no reputation to die for you and to suffer for you. So don't, don't, don't degrade him and say he's not God, or he's only God's son, or he's just a man, or, or whatever, he's just a prophet. He is God in a human form. He is God come to earth for you. And the prophets testify. Go and search the scriptures and see if they do not testify and speak of him. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You're right here.